Now, the next session is Les is More. Uh, we have a Harvard prodigy in our midst who uh, has worked with some of the biggest names in the music business. And through that, he's been inspired to create a company called Superphone. To tell you more about how that's going to disrupt that industry, please welcome Ryan Leslie. Yes, it is. Okay. Great. Great. Awesome. So, my name is Ryan Leslie. I'm from New York City. Uh, not from New York City, but I did come here by way of New York City. I actually came from New York, flew over the North Pole, and uh, landed in Sanya, China about two days ago uh, to speak at the Chinese Venture Capital Winter Summit, and then uh, got on a plane from Sanya to Shanghai to Dubai and got here yesterday and spent last evening sitting with a, a smaller group of young entrepreneurs who in many ways were much like I was about two years ago when I decided to embark on the journey of disruption that we're gonna talk about today. Now to give you some context, I am the son of Salvation Army officers. So that means my parents sacrificed their lives in the service of others. And that means that they being part of this organization needed a better retirement plan than the one that they had during their service. And so when I came along and I was born, they looked at me and said, you, son, are that retirement plan. <laughs> so growing up in the United States of America, my father was an immigrant from the Caribbean islands. And so he had a dream of being a trumpet player and he came over and was playing trumpet in the clubs in Washington, D.C. And my mother, who was born in Guyana, the daughter of a Chinese and a Dutch missionary who met in Guyana, followed my father to the United States. And she went to school, and he was playing trumpet. And one night, that trumpet... <laughs> <laughs> one night, that trumpet solo was the beginning of the guy that's standing here. And so my father, my father in his infinite wisdom in the late 70s made a deal with my mom that the pathway to the achievement of the American dream, the pathway to the achievement of financial success and security was going to be a direct one-way pathway and that was the pathway of education. And so the Salvation Army is organized like the military, and I moved. My first nine months of my life, I lived in a children's home, Salvation Army children's home in Suriname. And then I lived in Atlanta, Kentucky, Tennessee, Virginia, spent a year abroad in Brussels, Belgium. And by the time I was a junior in high school, I had attended four different high schools, four different high schools as a junior, three years in the United States, to be a junior, four different high schools, and straight out of my junior year, I applied to seven different colleges because I wanted to make my father proud. So when he asked me what I wanted to be in my life, I racked my brain, I thought to myself, what is it that my father wants to hear? Dad, you know what, uh, I'm 14, and uh, as I've applied to all these schools, I'm proud to announce today that uh, I would like to be a neurosurgeon. He says, son, I love that career choice. I love that. I got into the seven year medical program at UC Riverside. I got into three other University of California schools. And as a long shot, he had me apply to Harvard, Stanford, and Yale. Now the way this works is, if you get the small business size envelope, means you didn't get it. If you get the large package,
package, it means that you've been admitted. And so for all seven schools to which I applied, I waited, I waited with anticipation, and I was getting large packages. Before you see schools, large packages. And then I went to my mailbox one day and opened the mailbox and I got this little business-sized letter. And it was from Yale. And when I opened the letter, it said, hey, we reviewed your application. You did very well in your test scores. But at age 14, we think you might be a little bit socially undeveloped to come and matriculate at our school. So why don't you take a year off, see the world, get an internship, do something, but take a year off, and we'd love to reconsider you the following year. Now, I already had a bunch of large envelopes, and as we waited, I remember sitting in my, I think it was trigonometry or, or calculus class, and over the loudspeaker, Ryan, can you please report to the principal's office? I was the kind of kid that never got in trouble. So when that announcement came over the loudspeaker, all I heard across the entire classroom was, ooh, Ryan's in trouble. And I remember going to the principal's office literally terrified. And I walked in, I saw my guidance counselor. I saw my parents. I saw the principal. And I said, oh my goodness, what in the world have I gotten myself into? And my dad, because he felt like he actually owned the application process, had already opened the acceptance envelope from Harvard. And I was one of the first kids to go to Harvard from Bear Creek High School in Stockton, California. And the irony of this story is kind of twofold. Number one, I went into Harvard pre-med, and my first year at Harvard, I quickly realized that in order to be successful, I have to do what I'm passionate about. And so I went into the pre-med laboratories, and the young kids that were in there studying chemistry problem sets, cutting up little animals, I realized I was just not passionate about that. And I called my dad. I said, you know what, Dad? Remember when you, you know, remember when you had that star in your eyes and you came from the Caribbean islands and you wanted to do music? Well, guess what? I want to be just like you, Dad. And he said, no. No. I played my whole life. Are you not to choose that pathway? That was the first irony. The second irony is that my sophomore year of Harvard, I got a letter. It was a business-sized letter. And it was from a college that said, hey, look, you know, uh, we just wanted to find out what you were doing during your year off. I said, well, I was a freshman in Harvard during my year off. And it was from Yale. And during that time, I changed my major. And it was the first time that I was in school unsupervised. And so I took it upon myself to decide that if I wanted to learn how to be a music producer, I didn't have money to go to a different college. I could just learn from listening. And so I changed my major to government so I could take classes at the Kennedy School. And the Kennedy School only required for some classes, and I picked them wisely, that I only needed to go once a semester. The rest of the time I spent doing music. My final papers counted for 70% of my grades. So if I got an A on the final paper, I got a C in the class. By some great fortune, I still managed to graduate from Harvard on time. And since Harvard doesn't have a valedictorian, if you want to give the speech and address the graduating class, you just have to write it and compete. And if you've written the best speech, you're selected by your peers to give what's called the Harvard Oration. I didn't tell my parents that I got selected. And when I graduated in 1998, I stood there much, it was a little bit different, the crowd was a little bit more rowdy. But I stood there and I gave kind of the stump speech that everyone gives when they graduate from school. 
Follow your dreams, follow your passion, do what you really love. Some of you guys are going to be bankers, some of you guys are going to be consultants, some of you guys are going to be doctors, some of you guys are going on to law school, some of you guys are going to get your MBAs. But me, I want to be in the music business. And then my, all my peers, because we were all graduating, yeah, that's awesome. And my dad is just shaking his head. Don't encourage this guy. I graduated from school, and I'll fast forward here. I graduated from school. It took me eight years to get a break in the music business. And people say an overnight success takes 10 years. So I probably beat the odds a little bit by being able to make it an eight. And in 2003, I moved to New York City. I got an internship. The eight years prior to the internship, I hit very, very, very many challenges. In fact, I ended up, because I loved doing what I wanted to do, I love music, I ended up in a little garage, like storage unit, that's where I was living. I was living in a storage unit behind a barbershop. <laughs> One of my friends, his brother had a barbershop. I was living in the storage unit with my little music equipment. But I loved what I was doing. And in 2003, I moved to New York City and I caught that lucky break. And Puff Daddy, P. Diddy, Sean Combs, whatever you want to call him, he heard a piece of my music and he was working on a movie soundtrack, the Bad Boys 2 movie soundtrack. And he picked one of my musical compositions to be one of the singles for Beyonce on the Bad Boys 2 movie soundtrack. And I'll tell you that it was literally a snowball domino effect. Once Puffy decided that I was the guy who could do this kind of music, I was delivering above the usual output of the other producers in his stable, I worked on every single pro project. Beyonce, Snoop, Mary J. Blige, <laughs> Jay-Z, Madonna, Alicia Keys, the list goes on. And I started to put the creation, the making of the music in little clips on YouTube. And at that time, this is 05, this is the advent of YouTube before they had been acquired by Google. In fact, I think I got a t-shirt from YouTube that said, thanks for posting on our site. That's how early I was in YouTube. The moral of that story really is that I started to notice how the actual industry was shifting. And the industry of discovery, the discovery platform was shifting online. The platform at the time was a platform called MySpace. And myself and one of my buddies from UC Irvine had figured out how to actually hack the Google algorithm, if you will. So what that means is when you search MySpace as a keyword, MySpace.com was the number one organic search result. And because they were number one, they weren't actually jockeying for position for the other search results organically on the homepage of the Google search for MySpace. So we saw that as an opportunity for arbitrage. And so we actually owned the results two through 10 for the MySpace keyword on the homepage organically of Google. What can you do with that? Well, you can basically manipulate the MySpace music charts, right? Because anyone that types in MySpace would see MySpace.com and then they would see MySpace.com slash Ryan Leslie, MySpace.com slash Lex Life Official, MySpace.com slash Sassy Cassie123. Sassy Cassie happened to be my girlfriend because we needed more, we needed more profile. Right? We, we owned the real estate, we needed people to actually fill those slots. We needed more profiles. Now there was a large difference between me and Cassie. And the simple difference is that I look like me and Cassie looked like she. And both girls and guys, when they saw her profile on MySpace, wanted to click that profile. And in the span of just three months, 
while I grew to about maybe 150,000, 200,000 friends, she grew from zero to 650,000 friends in the span of three months, and then Google changed the algorithm. But that was enough time for us to completely overturn the traditional way that artists were discovered. So yes, Cassie was, pre-Justin Bieber, the first internet pop star built on a social platform. The social platform was MySpace. What happened, though, is that as users migrated away from MySpace, the equity that we had built in that platform for the audience literally disappeared. And so the idea for me was, what would actually happen if, instead of MySpace friends, we actually had a phone number a direct line of communication to every single person that was interested in supporting her. She went on to make music history as one of the first artists to have as many record sales as she had social followers. 650,000 MySpace friends, 650,000 albums sold. Hadn't happened before, hasn't happened since. Selena Gomez today, 100 million Instagram followers, her record company would love if the heavens opened and she sold 100 million records. Probably not gonna happen. The difference here though was that for me, I learned two lessons from that story. Number one, the lesson that we just discussed. When you move and you invest in a social platform where you don't own the audience, when that audience migrates, you lose the equity. And number two, if you let Puff Daddy outbid everyone to sign your girlfriend, you lose your girlfriend. <laughs> Today, Cassie is Puff Daddy's girlfriend. <laughs> and that's true, that's a true story. You can, you can Google it, man. all right? You guys are laughing at my pain. Thank you, thank you so much. That's what I came in to do. No. So, those are the two lessons. Now, what did I actually do based on those lessons? First of all, I wrote two albums about my heartbreak, the second of which was nominated for a Grammy. And, number two, it was the advent of the platform Superphone. And that simple concept of having a phone number on every single person that's interested and supporting or being connected to what I'm doing is now a reality, thanks to investors like Ben Horowitz, thanks to investors like Bessemer Venture Partners, thanks to investors like Andre Iguodala from the Golden State Warriors, thanks to investors like the founders of the game Angry Birds. And the reason why I believe I was able to stack my angel investor team the way I was is because when you have a warm relationship with someone, sometimes they may act irrationally. They may act irrationally. And what I mean is, I run an internship program in New York City. And it's for young kids that actually want to be in the music business. And a lot of times what happens is, I may get a recommendation from someone who may be what they call in the United States at risk. They may have gotten into some trouble as a juvenile. They may have dropped out of college. But if I get a recommendation from someone who I trust, I give that young person a chance. Nine out of 10 times, it works out extremely well. So the way that I actually was able to raise for this platform was pretty simple. The way my platform works is very, very simple. Every single one of you, you can shoot a text to that number, and my phone will remember where we are in our conversation. That means if you text me for the first time, it will know it's the first time you texted. If I don't recognize your number in my phone, it will automatically write you back and say, hey, I got your text, but I don't recognize who you are. Would you just take a moment and add yourself to my phone so I know who I'm talking to? That's number one. Number two is it needed to be a little bit smarter. I do want to know if people want to support what I'm doing. So as soon as you add your information to my phone, it will check my online store. I'm connected to a Shopify store. And if you haven't bought the products that I'm promoting at the time, what will happen is it will gently recommend that you buy the product. And number three, and most importantly, 
if you do decide to support me, whether it's be an investment, whether it's buying an album, buying a ticket, coming to an event, five minutes after you make that transaction, it will automatically send you, thank you so much. And so, in one year, in 2013, once I had built this platform, I put my number across all my social channels and I watched the text messages come in. Now, I have over a million followers across Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and during that one year time, 33,000 people texted me. Every single one of those 33,000 people received a response which said, hey, I don't recognize this number, but I would love to keep in touch with you. 30,000 of the 33,000 added their information to my phone. Every single one of those 30,000 people were checked against my storm. They all received a recommendation. Hey, maybe you haven't heard about my new album. Here's a link. Why don't you check it out? 17,000 of the 30,000 actually bought my record. Every single one of the 17,000 received a thank you text. One of those people was an entrepreneur in residence at Andreessen Horowitz. He sent me a message. Hey, Ryan, even if this is just automated, even if this is artificial, the fact that you have actually infused your mind, infused your methodology into this platform to actually thank me one of your tens of thousands or millions of social followers because I made that transaction, that's something that's important to me. And I'd like for you to meet my mentor and the guy I work for, Ben Horowitz. Now, I didn't know who Ben Horowitz was. I was on tour. It took me three months to actually do the meeting. I sat in the meeting. I presented this to him. I showed it to him on my phone. I said, yeah, I coded this myself. I learned on Code Academy how to do this. And, and these were my results. And on the spot, he committed $75,000 to my seed round. And he said, guess what, Ryan? Because I'm Ben Horowitz, in case anyone has any questions about why you should productize this, if anyone has any questions about why this could be valuable to anyone that's building a social following, if anyone has any questions about why messaging, why a phone number, why a direct line of communication converted for you the way that it did, just have them give me a call. People called, money was raised. And so today, I stand here in a very, very short amount of time. We've closed investments from Mr. Horowitz, like I said, I've named some of the other investors. Most recently, we have an investment from one of the largest recording organizations in the world, Warner Brothers, who will actually roll this out. But we're also productizing this so that literally anyone, the idea is that your phone number today is simply not as smart as a super phone number. And I have a very simple feature of super phone that allows me to never lose touch. And what that means is that any of you who send me a message today, if we meet at the cocktail party, we meet outside during lunch, we have a conversation, and it's real, I can just tell my phone, you know what, I, I just had a great conversation with Carlos, never lose touch. And my phone will ask me, okay, what's the interval at which you want to stay in touch? Is it every two weeks? Is it every month? Is it every two months, six months, year? And I'll say, look, uh, every two weeks. And if I'm texting normally and we're communicating normally, my phone won't do anything. But if two weeks goes by, and I've actually said that Carlos is important in my phone, and we haven't exchanged a message or a call, my phone will automatically initiate a conversation. Hey, Carlos, just check it in and see how you're doing. Very powerful. Very powerful. And the reason is, we amass contacts, we amass followers. Whether they are on LinkedIn, whether they're an email, whether it's an introduction from a friend who says, hey, you should talk to this person, follow this startup founder, you should track what he's doing, etc." And then so many times what happens is, if they're not top of mind, we don't actually follow up. Because we have our own lives, our own families, our own business endeavors that we're focused on. Sometimes even for my own mother, I had to set a reminder. Every week on Sundays I call her actually at 1 o'clock. My phone does. And if she ever misses the call, she always calls, hey, Ryan, did you call me? Yeah, it was super phone, but yeah, it was me too. 
And so the idea very simply is that social platforms, even though they're free and they've disrupted distribution, they've also, at least for me, really closed the gap or extended the gap, excuse me, between me and my followers. I have a million people across all my social platforms. I've never felt so disconnected. And so the ability now for me to actually have everyone, I'm currently on text today with over 60,000 people. Those people are extremely well organized. I know where they work. I know if they've actually invested. I know if they've actually bought my music, et cetera. Hey, well, oh wow, okay, they want me to do a demo. All right, let's take a look. So here we are. There's 58,745 people on which, with whom I'm texting. 58,745 people, right? And the beauty of this is that my phone number, right here, is on Instagram. 273,000 followers, 58,745 have texted me. Someone just sent me a text on Facebook Messenger. I didn't recognize the actual number, so I asked them, can you please add yourself to my phone? Carlos Wynn, right here, if you take a look, you'll see that there's a little blue dollar sign next to his name. That means that he's actually bought something in my store, right? If it's green, they spent over $100. If it's purple, they've either invested or spent over $1,000. It prioritizes all of my messages, prioritizes the conversations that I'm having with my network, right? So if I want to see at any given moment my conversations with investors, the 58,000 messages are now filtered to just 159 people who have been tagged by me as investors. I can tell very quickly that Luke, David, Chirsten, and Mark have actually invested, and Victor Wen, I'm still waiting on him to notice. <coughs> If I want to take a look at conversations I'm having with athletes, I can take a look and I can see that my investor network is 10 times as large as my athlete network. I only have 15 athletes that I'm talking to. Some of those athletes are actually investors as well. One of them, Mr. Iguodala from the Golden State Warriors, former MVP. When I take a look at this conversation, you'll see that my technology is helping to support me. I set a timer right here, if you'll take a look. Seven months ago, our communication ceased. I was talking to him regularly. Seven months ago, our communication ceased. I set a reminder that I don't want to lose touch with him. Two months. If you'll see right here, are you good, boss? Checking in. It's fine, Leslie. The two-month window had passed. It triggered a message. The beauty of this is, this isn't a chat bot. It initiated a conversation. And when the conversation is initiated, he responded, hey, I'm good, fam. Thanks for checking on me. Now the conversation is fresh again. I'm top of mind. The relationship stays warm. This was seven months ago, and as we look, I sent him an idea about Superphone. He ended up investing. The relationship became warmer. The communication wasn't email, it wasn't transactional, it was text. My phone is tracking how long it takes for him to respond. It tracks how long we spend on the phone, what is the interval between the phone calls, and then it builds a score of my relationship <laughs> personally. This is not a sales tool per se. It's actually migrated to a personal relationship management, enterprise level insights on my personal communication. I also happen to know where all my friends, family, and fans actually live. They're all plotted on a map for me. So when I land in any city, I can press a button and send a text. Hey guys, I just landed in France. Maybe we haven't caught up for a while. Let's catch up, have a drink, whatever we want to do, and figure out if there's some way that we can collaborate. And so really, the beauty of this is that once I can start to move to personal relationship management, the implications and the application for a super phone beyond just a fan texter becomes very powerful. And so that's why I guess we stayed up almost all night last night because 
other larger social platforms, other larger technology companies, other larger enterprises that are in the business of connecting people have come with acquisition offers. And one of them, a Fortune 2 company, last night sent me an NDA, so I can't tell you who it is, sent me an NDA about acquiring Superphone. And really, I believe that journey is directly correlated to the warmth of the relationships that I'm able to maintain through a platform that I was able to build, number one, out of necessity for myself, and number two, as I realized my own human shortcomings and the power of technology to actually assist, to actually support my own human shortcomings, I decided to productize. I was able to build support, and I was able to build Superfall. Thank you guys so much for having me.
Thank you guys for the additional time. Was like, uh, uh, congratulations on your success. Thank you. Really interesting idea. Um, as I was thinking of your presentation, like, you know, I was thinking about obviously any uh, product, you know, uh, they are leaders and then they are followers. So I think you've seen Apple come and replicate Microsoft's you know, success and you know, make the world better. So my question is twofold. The first thing is, how easy is it for somebody else to replicate your idea? And secondarily, it looks like you know, for other companies, you know, whoever those companies are that want to promote their products or services, you know, uh, you're going to sell your super phone right. uh, app. So right. 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 right, right, right. So is your business model to take a percentage of the sales, or is it you know, to sell it to them one time? You know, I'm trying to understand the business model. Sure, you sure. You can share that with us. Sure, I, I can share both. Okay. So uh, we're a SaaS business model, software as a service. And uh, we charge based on the number of contacts that you're managing or that we manage for you. Uh, so if right now there is a sort of range between 10 cents and 30 cents per contact per month on the enterprise level. And then on a more personal level, it's about a penny per month. And then we actually pass on the Twilio fees because we're built on Twilio. We pass the Twilio fees on to our customers, right? So they actually pay per message. And so, or a case in point, for someone like myself who has, let's, or someone that, let's say a, a light user that has 500 people in their phone, they pay five bucks a month, which is a penny per contact, for the 500 contacts that we're managing, and then they would pay a penny for every message that we have to automate, right? So if someone wants to send a broadcast to 500 people and it all comes as an individual message, they pay five bucks for that broadcast. And for any message that's actually creating and initiating conversation, they also pay a penny for that. The idea though on the personal level is that for Superphone to really penetrate the market the way that we would like for it to penetrate, it needs to actually be built into your existing phone number. So as it stands today, a lot of people would love to be able to have this kind of insight, intelligence on their phone number, but the friction point is the phone number that you get from Etisalat or Do is not smart enough. It doesn't have an API that can connect to your store, that can actually track how often you're messaging with someone, that can actually synthesize the messages with uh, sentiment analysis like an IBM Watson or Google Natural Language Processing. And we'd like to bring that directly so that when someone walks in to the Etisalat store, they get their phone, they immediately built into their cellular contract have this level of intelligence, networking, relationship building directly built into their actual phone. And they don't have to pay me because they're already paying a monthly subscription fee to a provider, right, that allows them to have this service actually for free. And that's really why I think some of the larger uh, social networking and telecom companies are coming to us because we do have a value add that should just be built into what you're paying for a subscription on a personal level. Our Atlantic Records deal is going to be more on the enterprise level. So if Bruno Mars has one million fans in his Superphone, they will pay us somewhere between 10 cents and 30 cents per month per fan. So if it's 10 cents per month per fan, and it costs $1.20 for Bruno Mars to have a direct relationship with one of his fans, and they actually buy a single for $1.29, or they buy a ticket for 45 bucks, or they buy a meet and greet for 1500 bucks, the return on that investment in the relationship with that fan is exponential. So I guess uh, to begin with, they need to have a substantial following, you know, either via Facebook or Twitter or you know, some other platform. Yeah, yeah, so you're saying, you're, 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 yeah, you're saying it, it requires a substantial following. I will say this, this is my retort to that. If you're Justin Bieber, right, and let's say you have a huge social following, first and foremost, it's almost impossible to extract from Twitter who the most influential people in your network are, which is why Justin Bieber really only has about five people who are super important to him in his career. And so the idea, the thesis behind Superphone is that 
If your phone can help you to surface the insights and get you to the five people that are most important, whether it's a music manager who's extremely well connected, whether it's a radio promoter, whether it's a booking agent, whether it's an actual journalist, whether it's an actual program director at a radio station, those five people, and people say this all the time, you are the aggregate of the five people you communicate with the most. The idea here is that there is no intelligence right now on one of our most dominant behaviors as humans, communication on text or phone. There's no intelligence. Maybe there's some Salesforce intelligence that's happening on email, but for the younger generation, and the reason I moved to text an instant messenger, Facebook messenger, is because I tried to run this campaign on email. And I went to a festival overseas in, uh, in, in Amsterdam, and I tried to do a fan meeting greet over email, everyone who's on my email list. And some of the fans that came backstage, they said, hey, Ryan, listen, we know you're cool. We think you're cool. But email is only for school and work. So. The idea here is that I didn't have a level of insight and intelligence, the ability to filter, to segment, to prioritize, the ability to actually prioritize based on how much someone had spent on text. I had it on email, and so that's why we built it on text. And so really it's about surfacing those relationships that are going to be most important to you. One last question. We have a question here from uh, this guy. Yeah, sure. Never mind. First of all, um, beautiful presence. Thank you um, so much. Second, my name is Sonia, by the way. I founded an uh, equity funding platform called Metrosoup, the vision. Um, second aside, you should transfer to here, I'm biased. Um, <laughs> and jokes aside, I was about to download your um, Superphone app, mm -hmm. but then I stopped when you said that you were in conversation with you know, two Fortune 2 companies. Mm -hmm. Because um, obviously you're collecting a huge amount of very insightful data on each of your consumers. Sure. Um, in the context of a potential acquisition, whether you go through with it or not, can you address the notion of privacy? Absolutely, absolutely. And so really the idea is about, it's about surfacing insights that are actually personal and private to the actual user, right? And um, I think we already understand and know that Facebook and Spotify and Amazon and Google are actually taking anonymized data so that they can learn more about just our species as human beings, right? And so we would just extend that same sort of uh, uh, analysis, anonymized analysis of frequency of messaging, of, you know, anonymized, I mean, I don't even know how anonymous our communication over the Google platform is. I don't know how anonymous our, uh, the, the analysis of our emails are, but I do know that if I send an email to my mom that says, hey mom, uh, when, well, where would you like to go on your next vacation? Then next time I'm browsing on Google, I'm gonna see an ad that says going on vacation, right? And so I don't know how anonymized it actually is. It seems at that point that it's extremely personal. Um, I think with any messaging platform, uh, we, we, we would love to be able to say that we can take the responsibility of, of uh, uh, building an ironclad private network or private silo in which we can communicate, but I think even across the mobile carriers, uh, even across you know any large social platform, we are going to be bound by the actual rules of those platforms. We're going to be bound by the rules of those carriers, right? So the reason why the FBI can actually say, hey, look, you know, Ryan is a is a T-Mobile customer, and we want to see all his records and they might actually turn those records over, uh, I think really is just more uh, of a testament to the world in which we live and the cloud in which we live, so to speak. So um, we're mostly focused on actually delivering the insights, delivering the intelligence, delivering the prioritization, et cetera. And uh, no matter where we end up, even with Twilio right now, we could try to encrypt our messages back and forth, or WhatsApp can encrypt our messages back and forth, and they're only locally stored. Uh, but somehow, some way, those messages are being stored somewhere, especially for us, because we're triggering messages based on activity. We're triggering messages and insights based on what you're actually doing. We need access to it. Uh, and, and I guess the only way that we can really address it is to do it in an anonymous fashion. Right?